everybody, and welcome to Healthy Living. I'm Chef AJ, and my guest tonight is one of my favorite people in the whole world, Miyoko Shinner. She is the author of the best-selling book, Artisan Vegan Cheese. She is a chef, author, entrepreneur, television host, and has been promoting delicious, decadent, and healthful plant-based foods for the past 30 years. She's the author of five cookbooks, including the best-selling Artisan Vegan Cheese, hailed as groundbreaking, revolutionary, and the holy grail of the culinary world. Her latest book is The Homemade Vegan Pantry, The Art of Making Your Own Staples. We're going to talk a little bit about that book today. And please welcome to the show my good friend Miyoko. How are you doing? I love you. I love you too, AJ. You know, you are, you know, except for that you're a woman, you're really a renaissance man. I don't know how you do it. You must be the hardest working person in the plant-based world. You, what don't you do? You, you're, you star in a TV show. You write best-selling books. You have a cheese company. You do animal advocacy work. You've had restaurants. I mean, when do you sleep? That, and you exercise and eat right. So when do you ever sleep? Well, not a whole lot. But you know what, AJ, I this is all stuff I've done over the past 30 years. So I've had a lot of time to work on all of this stuff, you know. I didn't do it all at the same time, so. Well, what is yeah. your passion? Because you do so many things. Is there something, I always ask this to people that do so many things. Is it Like if, if somebody said, okay, from now on, you can only do one thing. What do you love to do the most? Oh, my gosh. Um, I, well, it, you know, it really all depends on the time of, I mean, the period of my life. I would say right now the thing that I enjoy the most is, is uh, communicating with people, speaking to people, trying to inspire and writing some form of communication to inspire them to adopt a vegan diet and uh, practice compassionate, um, a compassionate lifestyle. Yeah. Well, you are a great speaker. We've had you a couple times at Healthy Taste. You're funny. You're, you're. Pr- I mean, you're just, you're just great. I just, I just think you're just terrific. What can I tell you? This is the, I could pr- be president of the Miyoko Shinner Fan Club. But what you've done is you have filled a big niche writing that book, Artisan Vegan Cheese. And I have bought more copies in that book to give to fr- people even more than the Pleasure Trap or the China Study, because you know, as a almost 40-year vegan, all you hear is, I'm vegetarian. I'd be vegan if it wasn't for the cheese. And now nobody has an excuse, right? Cause now- I've never, ever heard that. What are you talking about? <laughs> but what's great is you not only wrote the book, so now we can make our own, but now tell us about your cheese company. I mean, it's in the, I've seen it in the store now. Where can people get it i know they can get it online but let's talk about cheese because people want your cheese your cheese is the best out there i'm sorry but of all the brands it's the best well thank you well yeah. right now it's, it's available not only online but in about 200 stores uh concentrated mostly on the west coast but within the next year people should be able to find it pretty much locally anywhere um we're just about to get into a major nationwide distributor and then after that you know we'll start popping up in stores all over the country so it's a matter of time. It's going to be, you know, one region at a time. Um, but depending on where you are, I mean, down in L.A., you know, where you are, it's in a whole bunch of stores. It's about 20, 30 stores down there yeah, now. I know. It's yeah. fantastic. I mean, and it's also yeah. in my refrigerator. How long did it take for this dream to be realized when you started first? And how did you even get into cheese making? You know, I mean, did you figure this all out yourself? Or did there were there people that came before you that knew how to make some of these cheeses and you just took it to the art form that, that it is now? Well, you know, it, that's a lot of questions right there. So Sorry. let's start with how I got into cheese making first, and then we can talk about the company. Sure. But I have been playing around with cheese for about 30 years. Wow. Um, you know, I started out in Japan when I became a vegan, and uh, I missed, you know, I was a, a French food aficionado, and I basically, I probably practically killed myself just gorging on rich dairy products. Um, you know, I had a lot of physical issues at the time. My stomach hurt all the time. And I thought it was normal. I thought your stomach was supposed to hurt. And I remember telling someone that. And they said, what are you talking about? And I began to examine my diet and realized, you know, maybe it's all this, you know, rich dairy and, and all these, this dairy that I'm eating. I was eating, eating all these indulgent French cheeses and heavy cream and everything. So when I gave that up, my stomach issues went away. Um, and But, you know, I had developed a taste for such rich, indulgent flavors, I had to recreate them. And I tried for a long time. Initially, I started out by making yogurt cheese. So I would make a soy milk yogurt, and then I would drain that. And then I would make that, you know, I would flavor it with various herbs and things like that. Um, Never use any oil, by the way, Um, just straight fresh yogurt drained. It's It's a technique that uh, Europeans have been using for thousands of years, actually. So I just applied it to soy yogurt. 
Um, so, yes, I, I'm taking my ideas from traditional dairy makers. Um, and, uh, and I started playing around with nuts. You know, I was making cashew cream back in the 1980s. And uh, that was my heavy cream substitute, of course. And then um, I started making some very rudimentary cashew-based cheeses at my restaurant now and then in San Francisco. We had like a seitan parmesan, and we had a cheese that went on top of that. You know, it wasn't fermented, it wasn't cultured, but it was cheesy um, in flavor. So you know, it was a very rudimentary form. And about 20 years ago, I made a promise. Um, this wonderful vegan advocate. Uh, that many people know Lisa Shapiro, who recently mm-hmm. passed away. Yeah. Um, bless her soul. I'm sorry to hear um, that she was so young. Yeah, so young. But anyway, about 20 years ago, uh, we were talking. She said, if anyone can make a really good vegan cheese, it's you. You have to promise me someday you'll make a vegan cheese. And I never forgot those words. And I promised her I would, I would one day come up with a very, very good vegan cheese. And over the years, I kept thinking, you know, I still haven't made good on that promise. And meanwhile, the raw foodists were playing around with, you know, fermenting nuts and making these kind of basic uh, cashew cheeses that were really more like spreads than, you know, hard-aged cheeses or whatnot. Um, and I thought, well, gee, okay, this is a really good idea. What can I do with this? Can I take how many steps further? Can I use this as a base to come up with all these wonderful cheeses that I've been dreaming about for so long? So, you know, with the with the... The culturing that I was doing with the yogurt applied to the the stuff that the raw foodists were doing, and then I read all these cheese books, dairy cheese books on how to how to age and how to do this and that and the other thing. I just came up with you know I just really really threw myself headlong into cheese experimentation, um, so I could make good on my promise to Lisa. Wow! And um, that's really um, that was really the impetus was uh, that promise I made to her. That's so, so cool. I do. I call you the cheese whisperer because I, you're, it's just incredible what you're, you know, I mean, they look like cheese. They taste like cheese. It, it's incredible. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, the only problem is that cheese doesn't talk back to me when I whisper <laughs> to it. <laughs> well, you, you, you really are a, a, a genius with that. What, tell me about, you know, I, I met you after you had your restaurant, so I've never, I never was there. When did you have it and what was that like having a restaurant and did you enjoy it? Yeah, it was in uh, it was in the early '90s um, in San Francisco, and um, it was a lot of fun. You know, I mean, I think both you and I like to put on a show to some extent. You know, absolutely. We, you know, we're kind of performers at heart in a way. And having a restaurant is sort of like performing. It's like every night, it's like showtime. You know, okay, we got you know get the table set and the customers are coming and and now you know oh the order just came in. Okay, it's like instead of singing a song, you're putting out that you're creating that dish for that customer. And and then it's like, wow, do they like it? Do they not like it? Oh God, you know, you're t- like peeking around to see their reactions, and and then they give you, you know, they want somebody calls you out, like, oh, you know, somebody wants to meet you. Would you come out and talk to them? And it's kind of like putting on a show, and it it was kind of fun in that respect. On the other hand, it was extremely stressful because when I started the restaurant, or when I decided I wanted to start a restaurant, I also discovered that I was pregnant with my second child, Ooh. and I actually. Uh, broke my bag of water on the on the restaurant floor during the lunch <laughs> rush about two months after we opened. Seriously, <laughs> and it was just crazy. And then a week later, I was back at work with a baby on my back. You know, wow. I was like running around the kitchen, you know, chopping vegetables. So That's it was cool. kind of it was kind of crazy. And then a year later, I had another. I had my third child, so that was totally crazy. I took a week off both times, and otherwise, you know, I'm schlepping dishes and That's doing whatever because when it was a really small operation, so you do you know, I did everything. Um, you know, put, putting out fires, of course, um, literally and, and uh, figuratively, you know, mopping the floor, whatever needs to get done, um, you know, waitressing, um, cooking on the line, um, coming up with recipes, putting together the menu, whatever it was. It was a tiny restaurant, and, and you know, occasionally, you know, one day the chef didn't show up, and so next thing you know, I'm, you know, racing across the Golden Gate Bridge to get there in time to to cook, and it was just, it was crazy, and it was just not something that was su- sustainable for a long time, you know, with little, I had three little kids at the time, and, yeah. but anyway, yeah, but it was yeah. fun, Yeah, and you, <laughs> definitely. You, you raised three kids, you rescue dogs, you rescue chickens, and you still work out. I, I just don't get how you, I, I can't, I don't know how you get everything done. Well, I'm not working out, you know, I, but now my workout is, is really running with a dog. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I've just got to a point where I, I don't have enough time, hours in the day to do a separate workout just for me. So mm-hmm. now we do these hill runs, and, and so I find the steepest hill I can, and I race up the hill as fast as I can until I can't, you know, my legs just don't move anymore. Then I stop and take a break. And meanwhile, <laughs> the dogs are running all over the hillside, so they're getting their exercise. And so that's really kind of what I've been doing. But, you know, just trying to figure out some way where we can all have, get a workout. Yeah, and you eat, and I know, I've been to your house, you eat really clean. You eat, I mean, you, you make some of the richer recipes, but for the most part, you're, you're a really healthy eater. Yeah, I mean, for, for my daily diet, you know, it's, I eat very much like you. Mm-hmm. Although, you know, oh, I'm, not, I'm not salt-free, mm-hmm. um, but, for, you know, 90, 95% of the time I'm oil-free at home. Yeah. Um, you know, once in a while I use a little olive oil for something, but otherwise, you know, I don't, I generally don't cook with oil. I saute uh, without oil and I try to eat you know I basically eat like you whole grains yep. lots of beans um lots of vegetables yes yeah, Sal, yeah I, I saw you. you you really walk the talk and so th- can people still tell us a little bit about your tv show when you did it how that came about and if people can still see it oh yeah they can now I that's not well I, I can't say it's my tv show it's a tv show that is produced by delicious tv uh, who's run by a marvelous woman named Betsy Carson, and it, she conceived of the show. And she just called me out of the blue once and said, hey, I'm putting together the show with uh, Tony Fiore and Terry Hope Romero, and um, we're looking for, um, you know, I'd love to have you on the show. Um, it's a show with three uh, chefs, um, which is why it's called Vegan Mashup, because it's a mashup. So uh-huh. every every so we, we have now filmed um, three seasons. We just filmed the three the third season. It'll start airing uh, probably next spring. But the first two seasons are still playing. Um, it's aired on public television nationwide. In It's available in 228 million homes. Cool. And it has, it, it has been aired 16,000 times. Nice. And um, we have a different guest on every episode. And the very first time I met you, AJ, was yeah. when you flew up to my house I to know. be a guest. That on was, that um, one one of the episodes. Yeah, I know. That was so great. That, that yeah. was, as they say it in Casablanca, it was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Yeah. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you have so many terrific recipes. I mean, even before I knew you, uh, your very, benel- very benevolent Caesar salad that you do at the McDougal. That's the other thing you teach at the McDougal program. I mean, you have like, oh. you have 20, you're like 20, you have like 20 jobs. I, you know, I don't teach there anymore. I at, last summer when I started the you know Miyoko's Kitchen, yeah. it just got to a point when I just couldn't do that anymore. Oh. So I I have <laughs> since resigned, but I did teach for in the McDougal program for over ten years. Yeah, and and you created that recipe, the very benevolent Caesar salad, which they can get it on the McDougal website. That is a very delicious recipe. I know. I remember you telling me that the very first time I met. Yeah, I was you. always thinking that it was one of the yeah. best, uh, you know, Caesar-like uh, ones that I ever had. So that's a very, very delicious. I didn't Thank realize you. you were there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So you you have a beautiful new book out, and it's such an interesting concept, the homemade vegan pantry. It's 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 really cool because the fact that it's a vegan book is even cooler. But just the idea that we rely so much on these processed foods. And you don't have to because everything that we would rely on, like whether it's ketchup or mustard or macaroni and cheese in a box, you've shown that very simply and affordably you can make it and now you can make it vegan. I, I just think it's such a cool concept, the whole book. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I really, really want people to feel, I, I feel like the book can liberate people. So they don't feel like they're tied to having to buy a certain product, you know, all these different sauces and condiments and things that come in boxes and jars and cans or whatnot. Um, it's it's really, really fun once you know the science behind. It's a really, really simple science of how to make something like ketchup or mustard. And you yeah. realize, oh, my gosh, it takes two minutes to do this. It's so easy. And then it allows you the freedom to create your own version, you know, and put your personal touch on it. So I think, you know, I'm really hoping, I mean, this book should be, it's kind of like a lifestyle guide. It's not about, you have to follow this recipe exactly. Well, maybe you should the first time just so you know how it's supposed to work. But after that, I hope people will take it and say, well, now I know how to make mustard. I'm going to try adding this next time, or I'm going to do this or that. And I make lots of suggestions like that in the book, like, hey, you know, just take it for a ride, you know, take it 
to a new but place it, and, and create it, your own spin. It is really cool, and, it, and, and recipes are surprisingly simple. I mean, you know, some of your cheeses are a little complicated for somebody that's that, that's never cooked before. But in this book, really, I mean, I read the whole thing, and, and there's really not a recipe in there that, that a, a, you know, a person that, you know, a reasonable amount of skill couldn't make. That's right. And, in fact, you know, uh, speaking of um, an oil-free uh, product, in this cookbook I have three – Melty cheeses. I know oil contain oh, no oil yeah. oil at all. Yeah, I see it. Oil free melty cheddar, oil free melty mozzarella, and oil free melty pepper jack. That's so cool. And there's like four ingredients in each of them. I mean, there's you know, there's like they're not complicated at all. You so. know, in in a lot of your cheeses, maybe you can just talk about one of the ingredients because I know it's going to be unfamiliar to some of the people listening. Rejuvelac. Because could you talk a little bit about what that is if you have to make it yourself? Because I know you can get it at Whole Foods and other spe- you know um, health. I know it's one of those things that seems really really scary, but it's not. Simply, it it is simply a fermented. Um, basically, you sprout some grains, you pour water on it on it and then you just let it sit for a few days until it turns into a cloudy liquid. And it's something that just about anybody can do. The trick is using the right grains. Mm-hmm. So quinoa is the easiest, um, followed by um, uh, wheat, uh, what's it called? Wheat berries? What? Wheat berries, yes, thank you. Wheat mm-hmm. berries and uh, I've, I've had good luck with, um, um, I, said, I think, barley as well too. So... And some like millet oftentimes has been de germed, so which means that it won't sprout. And so people write to me and they go, I use millet and I can't get rejuvenated. It smells like stinky <laughs> socks. So it's it's sort of a cloudy liquid. Um, and what what it is is basically it's a fermented beverage, which means that it's full of lactic acid bacteria. And it's that lactic acid bacteria that will culture your cheese. So when you add it to nuts, all of a sudden you get this fermentation activity going. And that is what creates that sharpness or that tanginess or that cheesy flavor. And mm-hmm. when you're culturing your, you know, your product on your, your cheese on your shelf um, or your counter, what happens is it starts to capture wild yeast and wild bacteria, lactic acid bacteria that's, that's in our environment. And it creates all these flavors in the cheese. So, you know, yeah, it's, it just creates a much fuller, flavor profile than if you were to just pop open a probiotic capsule, which you could also do, but it's just, it's not as, it's not as good. But since Um, they do sell Rejuvelec now, at least at my Whole Foods, would it be okay if people did that instead of making it themselves? Oh, absolutely. If you can buy it, go ahead. But, you know, here, this is a homemade vegan pantry book, which has got to make Rejuvelec also. The other thing is instead of Rejuvelec, you can also use something like sauerkraut juice. Interesting. Oh, and I always have yeah. that. I, I love mm-hmm. those foods. Wow. Yeah. Great idea. A lot of people would might, might even have that in their fridge right now. So That's right. Yeah, cool. You know, I make your cream your cream cheese recipe that you made at Healthy Taste of LA and you've made at other demonstrations. It's just so easy. It takes literally two seconds to make. And I, I personally don't use it myself because, you know, I'm just, I try to eat very low fat, but I, I make food for people. And that is an ingredient in a lot of my desserts. And you, you know, you told me don't use that crappy stuff in the carton. And the minute you told me that I stopped and I make my own. I mean, not, well, not only that, but I mean, you know, I mean, the fact is the crappy stuff in the carton or the stuff in the carton, I don't want to say crappy because <laughs> you, know, you never know who's listening. You know, the first ingredient is usually palm oil mm. or some kind of oil. Yeah. And so it's a combination of all the, most of the commercial cheeses that are available, vegan cheeses, are a combination of processed oil and starches. So that's what you're eating. You're eating oil and starch processed starch Mm -hmm. and we're not even talking we're not talking good starches like brown rice we're talking you know just um so there's no nutrition you know nutritional benefit whatsoever so yes you're right my the cheeses that i make are based on nuts which are high in fat but it's a whole food still yes so I think there's a big difference there. Oh, absolutely. But, you know, another thing is, uh, because I didn't always know you and I didn't always know how to make cream cheese, The now that I make it with your recipe, I can 
for the price that it would cost me to buy one of those containers, I can make four servings. You know, I can make four oh, yeah. times as much. And you told me I could freeze it. So what I do is when I when it's time to make it, and I, some is culturing right now, I do a double recipe. So I'm using four cups of cashews, and the other ingredient is water, and then a couple tablespoons of yogurt, and I get four cups. And then I, I put them in individual Ziploc bags, and then, then when I need it for the recipe, I just pull it out. Yes, yes. That's, they, it freezes beautifully, and yes. that's what I do, too. I've got several batches in the fr- freezer right now my yeah. in my home freezer yeah. you know because if i want to bake a cream cheese cake a cheesecake or some kind of dessert you know it's right there all you have to do is thaw it and it's it's no big deal do you find that when the weather's warm like now it ferments a little bit faster because I'm, I'm oh oh yeah much faster yeah, i'm noticing yeah. that because i never yeah. know exactly how far to let it go you know like I, I always taste it and i'm like well is it sour and you know I, how do you decide you know like it just uh, how sour you well want I'll, to- I'll be Perfectly honest, at Miyoko's Kitchen, we actually check the pH. Ah. So it's very, very scientific. And you can't just rely on, on you know, flavor um, as you would at home. I mean, we have a very, very different, much more rigorous uh, procedure um, or process flow, as they say, at ah. Miyoko's Kitchen, you know, where we uh, grind something like 500 pounds of cashews a day. Oh, my. So. So we have to have a very, very strict um, process. And um, so we, you know, we monitor everything. We, uh, we do all kinds of, uh, we do ATT testing, which means we, you know, we uh, do a test, a swab test of all the surfaces for bacterial plate count <laughs> on a daily oh basis and send it off to a lab. And, you know, we do this stuff all the time. We measure the pH of all of our cheeses to find out, you know, the, the lower the pH, the more acidic it is. Um, and the sharper in flavor it is. So the longer you let something ferment, um, which means that there's more lactic acid bacteria growing in it. Mm. Um, you get a sharper, tangier cheese. So depending on the type of cheese you're making, um, you know, if you want something with a mild uh, tanginess, you want a slightly higher pH than if you want something like an aged sharp cheddar. Um, so... You said that but at home, yeah, go, I'm, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. You said that people can buy your cheeses online now. Can you tell us the website that they go to to purchase that, and how do you ship them because they are perishable? Yeah, so you go to uh, uh, miyokoskitchen.com, M-I-Y-O-K-O-S, kitchen.com, and you can order right there. Um, we have about 10 flavors that are available at all times, but we also have a limited edition that we, um, specialty cheeses that we introduce on a monthly basis, so um, this coming month, August, we'll be uh, selling buffalo mozzarella. Mm. Um, um, and um, we have a different, you know, so we have different flavor every single month. Um, you can get it online, but you can also get it in 200 stores um, across the country, mostly on the West Coast. And we do have a store locator on our website, so you can punch in your zip code and see if there's a store anywhere in your vicinity. But as I mentioned earlier, we will be nationwide in stores within the next year. That, um, so, that's fantastic. Yeah. Congratulations on all your success because it is such a such a terrific product. Which is the best-selling uh, v- uh, flavor right now? I would say, you know, it depends. Online, the best-selling flavor is uh, Aged English Sharp Farmhouse, and huh. that's our tribute to cheddar. Um, and in stores, the best-selling is Double Cream Chai. Interesting. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, go so, figure. I don't, yeah, go well, figure. With the Caprizi people, I mean, with the uh, buffalo mozzarella people can make Caprizi. That's, that's right. They right. certainly can. That's, that's we figured we that August is the best time for that. Oh, that's, that's, that's great. Yeah. Are you, con- is your, is your, you, you seem like the, I, I mean, I'm guessing, but you remind me of the kind of person that even when you sleep, you're not sleeping. You're probably laying down and thinking about recipes. Oh, or my God, stuff. please. It's, yes, it's terrible. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I wake up 3 a.m., you know, sometimes I just started meditating in mm-hmm. the morning just to just to help me kind of keep it all together because you know, I started on my June head is, yeah, um, you what? I just started on June 16th meditating regularly. Really? Is mm-hmm. it helping you? Yes, it's it's really important. I, I mean, I've been told for 30 years to do it, and I finally did it. Yeah, it's really important. I'm doing just God, you and Because we're the same. I mean, both of us, we're, <laughs> we're both maniacs. We're crazy. <laughs> it's true. I mean, I wake up in the morning. I mean, I go to bed at night, and I can't get just tossing and turning because, it's like, oh my God! Oh, then I got to do this tomorrow, and then this, and that, and then oh, sometimes I wake up 3 a.m. It's like, oh, I have to write, you know, this down because I got to make sure that this comes together, 
I mean, it's just, it's like nonstop. Um, and so meditation, I'm hoping, will really, really help me. I think it will. I think over time, it's, I think it's, the effects are going to be cumulative. So are you constantly trying to think of new flavors or cheese, or now are you thinking maybe maybe some other products to go with the cheese? Well, no, not that yet. We're, we are um, trying to, we're in the process of building our brand. Um, and so we're staying within the cheese arena for right now, or cheese or the dairy arena. Um, we are going to be introducing something that is, um, there's a recipe in my book for this product, and it's not at all oil-free because it's based on oil, but we are going to be launching a cultured vegan butter. Wow, that's fall. pretty cool. It's a European style. It's like a brick of butter. Wow. And it looks like butter, melts like butter, cooks like butter, bakes like butter. You're um, like there is not another product on the market like it. Yeah, you're, you're almost like a food scientist, you know? Like what, uh, what, yeah, yeah, we're actually going to be hiring a food scientist. We're, um, we're looking for one because I mean, I love the science behind food, but I'm not trained at all. Mm-hmm. And I'm always thinking about, you know, why something didn't come together. And definitely just the whole cheese thing has been um, a big learning experience for me because I've learned so much about various raw materials and how they work and everything. But um Yes, I love the science of food. I love to learn why things work and why they don't. That is so. Is it is it, is it much different having a, a cheese factory than it was having a restaurant? Because it sounds like you you know both are businesses and you're involving other people and, and you're very good at that, obviously. But were, are they similar processes or? Was... No, it's really really different. I mean, a restaurant is you know it's like you're thinking on the fly all the time and you can reinvent things. And having a, a food company um, requires a lot of precision and consistency and following procedures to make sure that the product is the same every single time. And, um, you know, there's just, there's a lot more involved. It's a lot more detail oriented. Right. Um, you have to have a safety plan and a sanitation plan and this, that, and the other thing. And, it, you know, it's, it's a multi-step process to produce one product. So for R and D, it's not like, Oh my God, the, you know, the, the zucchini blossoms are in season, and 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 the uh, the squash looks beautiful. Let me put this dish together as a special for di- tonight's dinner. You can't do that for R and D. You know, you're making something over and over sure. and over again um, just to get that precise formula. Taking into account, um, you know, the the supply chain and uh, the cost and all of this. So it's really. It's very complicated, actually. So there's not a lot of improvisation in that. that there, part. there is not much. That's why we decided to do this, uh, this monthly limited edition, where you know we let some of our cheese makers experiment and come up with um, a new flavor for, that we sell a limited edition of just for the month. That's cool. Maybe you'll even come up with a cheese of the month club. We're hoping to do that. In fact, we just hired a marketing manager, so that's one of the things she's actually going to do. Is yeah. Is, um, yeah, put that, that would, program in place. That would be a nice gift to get people, you know. I, I could, yeah. Yeah. So you said you were in Japan 30 years ago when you first became vegan. What were you doing in Japan 30 years ago? Well, I went back to Japan because I was born in Japan. I lived there as a child. Oh. And um, so I went back to Japan after graduating from college just because I felt like I needed to get back to my roots. That mm-hmm. was really the reason. Okay. And so I was living in Japan, and I was already a vegetarian. And I started eating more dairy in Japan than I had here in the U.S. just because I missed it so much. Mm-hmm. So I was just, I mean, it was just, it was disgusting how much cheese I was eating. <laughs> so. That's something. So one of the things I love to ask everyone I interview that has kids because it comes up so much, how do you get kids to eat healthy? Did you have a problem? Your kids are all at least teenagers or older now, right? They're at least. Uh... Yeah. my So they range from, but the youngest is uh 19 and the oldest is almost 25. Right. So they're, they're basically um, out of high school or, or, and did, was it a struggle getting them to eat healthy or, or tell us a little bit about that? Cause I know a lot of our listeners have kids and they sometimes struggle getting them to eat healthy. What was it like it, it being in your household? Well, you know, it was an evolution for me too, because I am eating healthier now than I was when I had my first child. So when I had my first child, um, who was 25, um, you know, I, this was right around the time that all this, I don't know, some vegan junk food sort of hit the market. And it seemed like, oh, my God, that's kind of fun. Let me buy this for him. And so he's probably the least healthy. Oh, he's, he's a healthy kid, but 
he probably eats the least healthiest of my three kids. Mm-hmm. Um, my girls, I had less resistance with. Um, we had a vegan household, and over even though we had a vegan household, you know, 20 years ago on weekends I was always cooking pancakes, and you know, I would say not as healthfully as we eat now. Um, but you know, as my diet evolved and I started eating more of a whole food plant based diet, getting away from you know processed vegan foods, um, the you know what we started serving at home also changed. And I didn't really have an issue with the girls except for when my middle child went to high school and she started to rebel because we had no junk food in the house anymore. Ah. And she started eating, you know, crap at school. And um, the funny thing is she's uh, an extremely health-conscious, um, oil-free vegan now. Wow. <laughs> so, I guess, I guess um, she's going through a phase, yeah. huh? Yeah, she went through a phase when she sort of rebelled. Um, so it's 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 really really hard, you know. Um, I didn't want to restrict them growing up when they were little. We were vegan at home, but you know, if they went to a birthday party, I didn't say, "Oh my God, you can't have that," because I saw, you know, I, some some parents are able to do that, and their kids yeah. don't rebel and sure. they're happy. But that didn't happen in my house, mm-hmm. and um, I also ha- had other vegan friends who had kids, and and um, I had one friend who was very restrictive and. The kid was just kind of went berserk at one point yeah. at a very young age. So I just didn't want to do that. So, mm-hmm. you know, I taught them about why we didn't eat animals and um, why we didn't eat, you know, dairy products at our house, but I didn't restrict them mm-hmm. um, when they went out. And so they were sort of lacto ovo vegetarians um, when they went out of the house. Mm-hmm. Um, and then at home, you know, we ate vegan. Um, and eventually I cut out more and more of the processed junk food, you know, stuff that we would, you know, like meat substitutes that I used to yeah. buy and stuff. I just kind of stopped buying it. Um, so okay. there was a – definitely yeah. it's an evolution. I think it's yeah. like that for everybody. Um, and, you know, I, I hand, my hat is off to people who – to the moms who can – who start out with a whole foods plant-based diet and can maintain that. Yeah. Um, I was I was never able to do that. Um, mm-hmm. So at least not in the beginning. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I say it's a, going unprocessed is a process. So you know, any it is. Any, yes. Any direction people can take in the journey towards optimum health, I think, is a good one. And people think, you know, you have to realize I've been playing this game for forty years. I mean, I had the worst vegan diet for the, on the planet for the first twenty six years. I mean, it's appalling what I used to eat. So I wasn't always like this. In other words, and no, you know, everybody, you know, just do the best you can and just keep moving that's, forward. That's, that's exactly I, right. That's, that's what exactly I say. Right. Um, yeah. You know, I was, I was as I was reading uh, the new book, beautiful photography, by the way, the homemade vegan pantry. One of the recipes that caught my eye, and maybe you could talk a little bit about it, and because it's it's so clever, and, and there are so many ways to use it, is the flaxseed egg whites. Yes, flaxseed. Funny you should bring that up. So that's <laughs> something I've been making for about thirty years. Yeah, tell um, us for a long. Time. That yeah. I love I love learning new things and like I learn so much from you like the cream cheese and I love things that I don't know you know like it's not it's that I can stuff that I can do so tell everybody like what it is and how you figured it out and what we can do with it because that could revolutionize that. well not re- not really haven't have you heard about aquafaba I have not oh well see so this is the one recipe in my book that's sort of obsolete although there are uses for the flaxseed meringue that aquafaba mm-hmm. cannot do so. I don't know, uh, earlier this year, some French guy discovered that all you had to do was drain a can of chickpeas, and you take that liquid, and you whip it up, and it whips up just like meringue. Huh. So my, you know, my, uh, I, I thought, oh, boy, this is going to be revolutionary, and people are going to start <laughs> making meringue, and then some guy figures out all you need to do is drain a can of chickpeas. So, and then someone named it aquafaba, um, which hilarious. means like, water of beans. But that's that's it. I mean, that is so much easier than uh, making the flaxseed goop. When you make the flaxseed goop, you can use it for certain things. It creates a sort of crispy texture for baking. So um, the flaxseed meringue works beautifully in making eclairs. Neat. Um, yeah. So you can make that shoe paste, shoe pastry that um, you know that is sort of elusive for vegans. Um, and you can make these great crackers out of it. Acts as, as a binder that. Um, grinding flax seeds doesn't do. So it does have other uses, yeah. but if you just want to whip up um, 
something that's akin to egg whites and make meringue cookies and aquafaba is a lot easier. So, I, I just you know, thought that was yeah. cool. I actually have a, I have two clients that are allergic to beans, so they couldn't use that bean juice. So oh, that's, then they, that's, yeah, so that they'll, I'll tell them about your thing. Has there any? Well, thank any, you. Yeah, is there any failed kitchen experiments? Like, is there anything that you have been trying to create that you just either haven't been able to meet your satisfaction level, or maybe not create vegan yet? Is there anything on the on the back burner that you're really uh, hoping to figure out? I am sure. Right now, I am working on a scrambled egg mixture, hmm. um, and I'm pretty close. And I know there's a company that's apparently going to launch it. But the idea is you pour something out and it scrambles in your pan. And the texture is very, very springy. You know how eggs are springy? It's been so long that I kind of remember, yeah. 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 So um, anyway, it's pretty close. Um, I don't have it perfected yet, but, you know, that's another R&D thing. I have to work on it some more. And I'm sure there are some things that I haven't been able to master um, that I just can't remember what it is, what they are right now. I just love people um, that can figure stuff out. I just like like when you were little, did, did your parents give you a chemistry set or an erector? Set? I mean, because you you have this creative mind. Like you just, it just seems like you love to figure things out. I do, but you know, honestly, I was never that good at science. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So, well, so who inspired you? I mean, like, like, um, you know, I always ask everyone, like, I mean, it doesn't have to be necessarily anybody vegan. It could be, you know, a relative, but like who, who inspired you either in, in your plant-based journey or even in life? Well, I mean, initially my culinary inspiration really came from Julia Child. Oh, oh. Um, I, I loved, I used to watch her all the time. I loved her. And I read both volumes of Mastering the Art of French Cooking when I was a, a, um, a vegetarian, not a vegan. Mm-hmm. And I just made my way through it. And I tried to I rep, tried to replicate most of her recipes using things like you know seitan uh, for the meat or or whatever. And and then when I became a vegan, um, I tried to make her recipes using cashew cream or whatever. So she was very inspirational. Um, you know, back in the 90s, you know, John Robbins was sort of very inspirational to me um, to help me understand the implications not only on our health but on the environment on animals. I wasn't aware of a lot of that until Mm -hmm. um, he came along. Um, So there have been, you know, all sorts of inspirational figureheads. You know, I can – the list can go on and on. You know, I find Gene Bauer to be extremely inspirational. Um, I love watching you on stage. (laughs) <laughs> um, and in seeing what you have done for so many people. Um, it just seems like more and more, wherever I turn, there's another source of inspiration. Um, so, you know, I read so, I have so many vegan cookbooks and non-vegan cookbooks. Um, I have so many, you know, books from by people like Dr. McDougall as well. Um, so I, I think it's just a really, really exciting time when so many wonderful leaders are, are rising. Um, and shining the light and leading the way. Did you in, um, did you enjoy working at the McDougal program? Oh, I loved it. I had a great time up there. I loved everyone there. Everyone there is so passionate about learning how to make a positive change in their life. And um, I don't remember a bad class I taught. They were <laughs> all so fun. I loved engaging. And, of course, I love, you know, Mary and John. Sure. Um, and everybody else up there, too. Um, and I'm sad I can't be there anymore, but right now um, I have to focus on uh, the cheese company and, um, you know, the, 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 the traveling that I'm doing with speaking engagements and cooking demos and that sort of thing. Um, I know you do this really fun bit where you speak in Japanese and you wear a kimono. Did you ever, oh. do, that at, <laughs> did you ever do that at the McDougal program or is that just more for the events that are not uh, medically based? Well, John is the one who got me into doing that. Oh, I did not know that. You know, I so I was teaching a Japanese. He wanted me to teach a Japanese cooking class up there. So I I was doing I was teaching two days, uh, and so out of a five day cooking period, I would teach two of those days. And so mm-hmm. I, I did one day of kind of a regular thing, and then one day of Japanese. And John said, "Oh, it'd be really really funny if you you know, um, you know, could wear a kimono and do do something." Or <laughs> so I did that one time, and he got such a big kick out of it. He oh, said, "Do that again. Do it next time." 
you know, I, I thought it was just going to be for this one thing. I just did it to entertain him. And he would just stay and watch. He would, every single class I did that, he would stay just to watch me do my little shtick, and then he would leave, and he'd that's crack up. Great. That's so. great. Yeah, I loved it. That was, that was yeah. so funny. you have any fun stories on either Dr. McDougall or Mary that you can share? I think they're both awesome. Oh, my God. No, I can't, I can't tell you or everybody. I will disappoint everybody. Well, okay, I'll tell you. But, you know, Dr. McDougall is, I, I mean, the one thing about being on a low-fat plant-based diet is a lot of people are really, really scared of it because they feel like they can't, they're going to fail. They're going to mm-hmm. slip. And Dr. McDougall showed me what a real human being was when he came to my house for a party one time. And um, I had some things that were oil-free and some things that were not. So when he, he and Mary came, I said, oh, I, you know, you can have these four items, but these three have oil in them. And he goes, oh, as he popped one in his mouth, I eat anything at parties. Oh, great. That's and so it was just, it, so it was really, really, he That's just, nice. you know, he wasn't going to overindulge. He knew he could control himself. And obviously, if you are, if you are, you know, like, as you have often said, you're a food addict, and so right. you just can't do it. I can't. So if, you're, if you have that kind of issue, that's one thing. But a lot of people don't have that issue, but they don't feel like they're good enough. It's sure. like, I, you know, they fall off the wagon, and they feel like, oh, my God, I totally screwed up. Yeah. And you don't have to feel that way. It's okay. just, you know, it's, it's not the end of the world. Um, and, you know, if you follow it 99% yep. of the time, um, you know, it's, it's, you're not going to be, you know, you're not going to go to your grave all of a sudden because okay. you popped that one well, how, thing that had oil so in your mouth. How fun that you had them in your house. That would be, that would, that sounds like it's just a lot of fun. It's nice to know that they're human. You know, I want to talk about your best selling book. Now, you said you had five books, and I have two of them in front of me Artisan Vegan Cheese and your latest one, The Homemade Vegan Pantry, both, which I recommend. You said you, ha- it said you had five books. So, what are the other three? Well, it's actually four and a half books. Oh, okay. So the first cookbook I wrote was in 1990. It was called The Now and Zen Epicure. I have that, yes. Okay. And then um, I wrote Japanese Cooking. Oh, I have that too. Uh, traditional and Contemporary. <laughs> I actually have. So I have four of you. So what's this half book that I don't have? So the, the fourth and a half book was a revised edition of The Now and Zen Epicure that came out in 2000. I think in 2000, and that's called the new Now and Zen Epicure. Mm-hmm. So that had about 30% new recipes Okay. in it. So that's why I say it's four and a half books. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or since it was only 30% new recipes, maybe it was four and a third books. But anyway. So you, you know, you had also, you mentioned to me not to buy, to buy the, 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 cream cheese that I was buying, which I don't even see anymore in the store, because hopefully you, you probably put them out of business, because yours is so much better. But you also, you have some opinions on tofu. Do you, so that, that there's certain kinds we should buy, like, do you make your own tofu, or do you buy tofu? I, well, I have a recipe for making your own tofu in my book, mm-hmm. and, and I do make tofu occasionally, and uh, tofu is a thing of beauty when you make it fresh. It is absolutely delicious. Um, but I did buy tofu. But see, I was raised, Japanese tofu is a very different kind of tofu than the, than the very, very hard-pressed tofu. Americans want tofu to be very, very firm mm-hmm. so that it has kind of like a rubbery texture. And that's really not what tofu was designed to be like. Mm-hmm. That's kind of like an American version of tofu. No, okay. you know, no Japanese would eat that and think that tastes like tofu. Tofu uh-huh. is very delicate, actually. Um, and in, traditionally in Japan, there's two types of tofu, and that's it. There's momen tofu and, uh, and then the silken tofu. So the um, – mo, um, mo, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to use the Japanese there. The, so the regular tofu is a, would be considered, I guess, what we would consider something like medium. It would, it's kind of – it's in the, um, the plastic tubs with water, and it's right. s- softer. And then silken tofu um, is very, very silky. And that's, those are the only two kinds in Japan. And then in America, there's every different kind of texture because what they've done is they separated the curds from the whey and then they press mm-hmm. it. Um, and they press it, you know, uh, different lengths of time. And you can also increase or decrease the amount of the coagulant, which is either magnesium chloride or calcium sulfate. And the more you add, the firmer it gets. Mm-hmm. 
Um, so the, the stuff that's in the vacuum pack um, that you might throw on a brochette for barbecuing is a very, you know, had, probably has a high ratio of magnesium chloride. And mm-hmm. then it's impressed even further to make it that firm. I just find that when it gets to be that firm, it doesn't have that delicate tofu flavor. It loses it. So I personally don't like it. Um, I prefer the softer ones. Um, it's kind of hard to get really good tofu in the United States, in oh, my opinion. Okay. Um, it's fine if you flavor it sure. you know, by making it, turning it into a scramble or if you're going to puree it for a dessert or you're going to freeze it and then crumble it, then you know, it really doesn't matter how it tastes. But if you're going for the flavor of tofu, you see, that, I, mean, I guess that's what I'm trying to say is that in America, tofu is something that you don't eat by itself. You mm-hmm. have to cover it up. You know, it has to masquerade as something else sure. in order for it to be edible. In Japan, you eat tofu just like that with a splash of soy sauce. Interesting. Because it's delicious on its own. Yeah. So um, so do you not recommend the aseptic packages? You recommend that if we're going to buy it? No. We buy it in do not. You don't buy the aseptic packages because that's not natural. They make okay. it in there, and they add, um, in order to make it that firm consistency, they've added... Um, Isolated soy protein. Oh, didn't know that. And do they yes. do they list that on the label though? They sure do. Okay, I'm going to check. Thank you. That's yeah. So, so if you're going to get tofu, get it in a vacuum pack, or get it in a tub. Okay. Cool. So you said you were born in Japan. When did you move to the United States? I was about um, I was about seven when I moved here. Okay. So did you grow up speaking Japanese first? I did. It was my first language. I what? didn't know a word of English when oh, I came that's here. So funny. So what do you remember what you ate the first seven years of your life? And what and is it similar to what they're eating in Japan now or have they gone all um standard American diet? They have gone no, they still eat a lot of Japanese food, but they're moving more and more towards incorporating a standard American diet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um but I ate a lot of rice. I ate a lot of um I ate fish. Mm-hmm. Um, I ate, um, vegetables. Um, you know, it was, a, I ate natto, um, which is fermented soybeans, mm-hmm. um, miso soup. Um, it was a very simple diet. And then occasionally, you know, a big treat would be watermelon in the summer. And we uh-huh. used to have this, this game in Japan. It was one of the, my fondest memories is you take a big watermelon to the beach and then you get blindfolded and you have a big stick and you have to you have to go, go around and try to hit the watermelon. It's sort of like the piñata, but it's a watermelon. the Japanese version of the piñata. That's exactly right. And then when the watermelon breaks, everybody goes and grabs it. And I just remember that watermelon being just, oh, so sweet and delicious. And we didn't have ice cream. And occasionally, my mother would take me to Tokyo, and we'd go to a department store, and we'd get a little tiny scoop of ice cream. But, you know, that was getting ice cream was like, you know, once or twice a year. It was yeah. such a rare treat to have something like that. Well, I think you, um, you grew up eating so healthy. Unlike myself, you didn't have you didn't develop any of these food addictions, and so that's that's really awesome. Do, you know that that watermelon uh, comparison to the piñata that's that's much healthier because usually what comes out of the piñata is candy, sometimes absolutely. bloody, but often candy. So, what do you remember eating for breakfast when you were younger? Probably miso soup and rice. Yeah, yeah that's it. Was it white <laughs> yeah. rice? What was it white rice? It was it was white rice. It mm-hmm. was definitely white rice. Yeah. Um but you know, we ate I ate rice just about three times we I ate rice all the time. Um, I love rice. And uh, and rice doesn't eat. make you fat. No, it doesn't. That's, yeah. I love that because you know when yeah. because you know I'm I'm all for the high carb uh, diet, you know, that's basically what I'm on, potatoes, rice and beans, high starch, and I eat a lot of rice and I love all kinds of rice, brown rice, wild rice, which actually isn't rice. And I was always afraid of eating rice too and then um, you know, I, I think about you because you know when people you, that you said you know how many fat Asians are there? Well, maybe maybe now there are some, but not 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 traditionally. And no, and, no, they, we were everybody was skinny as a stick, you know. Okay. When's the we last? Right. Time, when was the last time you were in Japan? Because I was there twenty years ago, and I noticed people were just starting to get a little bit fat. There was KFC and Wendy's and McDonald's, and it was really expensive in nineteen ninety four. It was like six dollars to buy a Big Mac in, in total. Oh, I bet. Yeah. Well, um, I was last in Japan at the end of 2013 in December. My son is a professional basketball player in Japan. Oh, wow. So I went to, we went uh, as a family to go see him play. That was his, his year as a rookie. He's been there for, he just finished his second season. He's going back. He's home for the summer, but he's, because, um, you know, they don't play in the summer, but he's going back 
and uh, at the end of August for his third season there. Um, so we went back there, and yes, definitely, you know, there's you don't you, you definitely don't see as many fat people as you do here. So sure. you are beginning to see them, and you are beginning to see people that are a little bit plumper, not as um, you know, not as rail thin as they were. You know, everybody was slim. Everybody was slender. Um, you know, when I was growing up there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but definitely today, you know, the hotel where we stayed for breakfast every morning, they had rice and miso soup and yes. salad and right. four or five different kinds of vegetables. Yes, and, thank you, thank and, you for um, that. Thank you, because, you know, people think my ultimate weight loss program is so weird because I suggest vegetables for breakfast, but when I was in Japan at a regular hotel, that's what they served me, That not because I was vegan. Miso soup, rice, salad, and vegetables. That's right, yeah. That's, yeah. I mean, you still eat that today, you know. Yeah. I mean, there were other options. They had now incorporated eggs and mm-hmm. sausages or whatever. But, you know, most people are still eating, some people are eating um, the American breakfast, but most people are still eating rice and natto. That's what I had for breakfast every morning, rice, natto, big salad. It was great. Yep. I loved it. Yep. Good, good, good. Thank you for saying that. You know, what I noticed when I was in Tokyo was that even though they had some beautiful desserts, they seemed to be influenced a lot by maybe the French. It looked like, a lot yes. like French pastry, but they weren't sickly sweet like desserts are in the United States. Well, that's because French pastries, I mean, desserts in Europe aren't sickly sweet. Right. Like, and so that's, I mean, that's one thing about my book. I have a chapter on sweet endings. Mm-hmm. And even though I do use sugar in uh, most of those recipes, none of those recipes are as sweet. Absolutely. As, they're, they're based on European techniques. Right. Um, so, I mean, that's one thing I'll say about the book is that there are things like cake mixes. If you ever grew up, you know, if, you, if you're a parent and you have kids and it's like, oh, mom, I need brownies for tomorrow, it's kind of a drag to have to pull all your ingredients out and yeah. start from scratch. And so that's why I have things like cake mixes that make it easy. You know, if you sure. make a big batch of mix, you just pull it out and mix it with some soy milk. And I have an oil-free option for all of those mixes, too. That's so. so cool. Thank you. And and the the oat gelato, that I haven't tried that yet, but I want oh, to the vanilla really one. Good. That looks so, fa- that's so fascinating to me. So the oat gelato, I was so proud when I came up with that, actually, because it is a gelato that has that's basically pureed oatmeal of of sorts, <laughs> that's and cool. and it doesn't have any oil in it, so it's a completely fat free gelato, and it's creamy and luscious, and I love it. I love I that oatmeal. I mean, not make, the oatmeal, that ice cream. Yeah, wait to make the vanilla. Yeah. We have a few questions that people wrote in, but before I get to them, I just want to talk about a, just a little bit of a controversial thing, just because I'm going to ask your opinion on it. This just came out today. Um, I, you know, I subscribe to nutritionfacts.org, you know, Dr. Greger's wonderful uh, uh, website, and we've had him on the show, and it was about nutritional yeast having high amounts of lead. Now, I know that, you know, Dr. Goldhammer, who I work for, he's as strict as you can get, and he never lets us use nutritional yeast for for this, for for many reasons, and that was one of them, and I know that in some cheese, uh, that is a flavor that's, that's pretty much necessary, so I'm wondering what your take is on this, this controversy now about nutritional yeast. Honestly, I don't have an opinion. I have read contrary things about it. Okay. And I am just, I'm not, um, we're probably going to be switching to a, an or, we finally, it's been a long process. We, we're trying to use an organic nutritional yeast. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that makes any difference or not, but we couldn't get the flavor profile um, right. We recently found a, it's another yeast. Um, that is organic and uh, has a wonderful flavor profile. And sometime next year, we may be switching to that. I don't know if it's the same as nutritional yeast. I honestly am not an comment sure. on that. Okay. Well, I just thought it's just because it was in today's email, I thought I'd mention it. And then what about um, the- I will have to check that out because yeah. um, I'll check out this website. Great. Um, what about things like agar, carrageenan, and xanthan gum? Because some, and not agar so much, but, you know, some people are thinking that carrageenan and xanthan gum, because these are ingredients in some of your recipes, to avoid them. I, maybe, what, what are your thoughts on those? Well, to be honest, I am actually working on a revised edition of Artisan Vegan Cheese. Okay. So and, that's, that's um, the other half of your 4.5 books. So, so then I'll, I'll be up to five. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so... I'll have two half books. So um, there will not be any carrageenan in it, not because, and I have, that—that that is something that I do feel 
I'm somewhat confident to speak about because there is one person who has made it her crusade to um, Dan Karajin and um, Joanne Tabak- Tabakman, and I've actually read some of her papers, and um, I wasn't convinced and the FDA wasn't convinced, and um, it, it's not exactly, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, there's, I'm really on the fence about it. it. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, um, but there are lots of arguments to the contrary about um, the dangers as well of carrageenan. But because it's controversial, I'm just trying to avoid all sure, controversy. Sure, I know what you mean. Yeah, I mean, I, so, and I'm not, and I'm yeah, not so asking I'm t- you to put you on the spot. I just, I just, these are questions I get. And, you know, one of the reasons I use the Instant Pot now is because just people would complain use, when I had a nonstick insert, you know. So it's like you can't make right. everybody happy, but you make as many people happy as you can. And That's right. I, and so, yeah, so we don't, so in Miyoko's kitchen, we don't use any carrageenan. Mm-hmm. Cool. And in the homemade vegan pantry, I st- I didn't use any carrageenan. I mm-hmm. used agar for the melty cheeses. Right. And and xanthan um, gum is that is that controversial? And I didn't. I don't actually. There's no xanthan gum in any recipe in the homemade vegan can pantry. I think except for the gluten free brown rice pasta. Okay. Um, that was required because of the lack of gluten. So I mean, it's like you're going to get slammed for gluten. Yeah, you're gonna, get sl- con- you're gonna get slammed for using, you know, anything and everything. Listen, now that um, I'm and, the guy, I realize you're gonna get slammed for everything. So, <laughs> so it's a, you know, I actually just came back from Italy. I was there for Vigano Italiano tour. Wow. I was one of the. I was leading um, a tour of vegans there in this beautiful region called Cilento, which is sort of the, um, the one of the uh, epicenters of the slow food movement where people are eating the same way they've been eating for hundreds and hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And it's an area where 80 to 90% of the diet has been traditionally vegan. Um, They, most people, you know, eat primarily a plant-based diet, uh, unprocessed. Um, They make everything from scratch. Um, You know, there's almost nothing in the stores. I mean, there are very few stores. Everybody grows their own vegetables. They make their own uh, tomato sauce. They make their own olive oil. They make their own wine. Um, they make everything. They don't use butter. Um, you know, the oil they use is olive oil. That's all they use. Mm-hmm. Um, but they don't use that much of it because they have to make it. And you know, they grow their own olives and then they wow. press it themselves. Um, they do. You know, they, they they put my book, Homemade Vegan Pantry, to shame because they do everything from scratch. That's so great. Um, but they eat mostly grains and legumes. I mean, most of the meals are vegetables and legumes and grains. That's did what you, they eat every day. Did you shoot and, any video? What, did you shoot any video? These sound like remarkable people. It I did. Like I, a I did shoot video. Yeah. I did shoot video a little bit, and I wrote a, a blog post about it. If people want to read it, go to artisanveganlife.com. That's my my personal website, apart from miyokoskitchen.com, mm-hmm. where I wrote a, um, a blog post called um, Living the Artisanale Life, um, Living the Artisan Handcrafted Life. But, you know, what moved me about these people is they're not fussing about, oh, my God, is, are there any superfoods in this? Oh, my God, this has that in there. That, they're just eating food. Right. That's what they're doing. They're just going about their business, going yeah. about their life, and eating whole foods. And they're not fussing about every little yep. thing. Yep. Um, and these people, you know, they're blue zone people. They're living into their – they're very close to Sardinia. And they're living to, you know, they're working till they're working in the fields, and they're, you know, and when they're 90, they're still out there moving about and living their lives. Um, and I, in some ways, I feel like in America, we, you know, what, what is that word um, about obsessing with nutrients? Um, orthorexia. Uh, orthorexia. Orthorexia. And we're getting to that point where that's just not healthy. I mean, there's like fussing about. Every single yes, we shouldn't eat processed foods. We should be careful, but there is sort of a limit. At some point, you know, hey, relax. Let's I, let's just I, eat food. I agree with you because the stress of worrying about it is probably worse than just eating it. <laughs> yes. Hey, so you said you led a tour uh, a tour of vegans. How did you get this job, and how did the people on the tour know about it? Because I, I mean, that sounds incredible. It was great. Um, it was put on by Green Earth Travel and Tierno Tours. And about a year ago, they asked me if I would be on one of the weeks. They wow. they they had four different weeks with different vegan you know um, authors and 
writers you know, and people. There, uh, there's a there there used to be a show on the Cooking Network called Biography, where they would actually do like bio- biographies of different chefs. And you're you would be fascinating because you have had you know such an interesting life, and you still have. I mean, you know, you have your fingers in so many pies, and you just that I just I would love to see a a, a film about you, a biography about you. You know, honestly. Oh, well, thank you. I think you're like one of the most fascinating women I've ever met. And I really enjoyed talking to you. I have a few questions, and then we'll we'll wrap it up from people that um, wrote in. So the first one is, is basically, can I freeze cheese? uh, Kathy writes, I just made her vegan cheese, the bursant, spread it, uh, 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 spread our tomatoes with it, froze one. I have lots of rejuvelac left. Can I freeze the rejuvelac? Can I freeze the cheese? And if so, for how long? Yes, to both, and you can freeze it for many months. Okay, cool. Thank you. My son is highly allergic to all nuts. Are there any cheeses I can make without nuts? Um, Well, can you make, can you use uh, seeds? uh, You can use sunflower seeds, possibly. Um, And then there are some, I have an oat cheese, in uh, the oat American cheese in one of my books. How cool, Um, yeah. So, you can. Um, another thing that I've actually played around with a little bit is uh, white rice Ooh. that can be fermented, um, processed once once it's cooked. Um, so there are ways of getting around that, yes. Wow. Very cool. Uh, let's see. Who is this? I, I can't read. Uh, Jan writes, one of the things I really love is blue cheese, especially on salads. Does she have a recipe for a good blue cheese alternative? So my new book will have a blue cheese recipe in it. Okay, what's your um, new book and when does it come out? Uh, gosh, I don't know. I'd have to ask, I have to ask my publisher. All so right. there's a little bit of waiting, and I can't disclose any recipes. Sure, I understand. Um, but you the, you know, eventually, you I hope we'll, that Miyoko's Kitchen will be able to come out with a blue cheese too. What really makes blue cheese blue cheese is the mold, which is penicillium Roque Forti. Mm-hmm. Um, and we just can't make that right now because we don't have room in our facility. But eventually we hope to be able to introduce um, bloomy rind cheeses as well as blue cheeses. Wow. Can you, if you, I know you can't disclose the recipes, but can you tell us what the book's about or is that top secret as well? Oh, you mean the 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 uh, the blue the next, cheese recipe? Well, no, the next book. What what your next book is? Oh, oh, the next book is you know, it's a re, the revised edition of of oh, artisan see, vegan I cheese. See. Great, thanks. All right, yeah. well, so uh, just one question. I'm just going to ask you just for fun. All right, let's say you were on death row for a crime you didn't commit, because I know you wouldn't do that. What would you have as your last meal if you could have anything in the whole world? Oh, anything in the whole world. Oh my God. Um, it would probably be some really delicious handmade chewy pasta dish <laughs> with um, maybe the Umbrian tartufo sauce that's in my book, something like wow. that. Or it could be something very Japanese and satisfying. Um, it might, you know, um, I, I like rice. I, I find rice to be very, very comforting. Oh, so yeah. some, mm-hmm. some kind of rice dish maybe. Mm-hmm. I know it sounds kind of boring, but no, um, something all. that Thanks. would be comforting and, you know, put my mind at rest yeah not at all. hey so um you know your brother you that you know you, you were able to get your family to you know not your not your kids but i thought that's so cool because i met your brother and sister-in-law and they're awesome and their kid and they're they're vegan now so you, you oh know, yeah and, my, and two of my daughters my, my daughter two of the three kids are vegan in my household that's, too that's so um yeah so I, it took a long time working on my brother and he used to just you know, he seems like get really, really mad at me and tell me to get off my soapbox and stop preaching. And now he <laughs> makes a joke because he, he says now he's the one who goes to work and preaches to everybody. So. <laughs> kind of like a reformed <laughs> smoker. That's great. Well, Mayoko, yeah. you are just, I just thank you because I know how busy you are. So thank you for taking time out of your schedule. You're so busy that you can't even be on my TV show that's going to shoot at the end of this month. And I'm heartbroken because you were my like t- in the top three from all the people I wanted to have on. So hopefully healthy living will do another season and, and it will work within your schedule. But I would love to, since you can't be there in person to feature one of your recipes and even show your product on the air, if you'd like, I'd be happy to do that. That would be great. And that congratulations. Would, yeah, I'm really, really you. glad that that campaign was successful. Yeah, it, and thank you for promoting it and supporting it. And thanks all of you guys for, for doing the same. So my guest today is the, is the amazing Miyoko Shinner, author of the best-selling artisan vegan cheese and the new book, 
The Homemade Vegan Pantry, and two and a half other books, and I recommend all of them. And please just once again, Miyoko, tell people how the best way they can get in touch with you or find out about where you're speaking or or get more of your recipes, and uh, that would be great. Yeah, uh, basically go to miyokoskitchen.com, M-I-Y-O-K-O-S kitchen.com, and uh, you can contact me through there. Um, and my, my speaking engagement schedule is on there as well. Um, you can also go to artistandveganlife.com. Um, I don't really update that very frequently. Um, so okay. you know, kitchen is probably better. Do you, do you have any speaking yeah. engagements in the near future? Um, yeah, I've got a bunch, actually. Um, I've got four book signings coming up in the uh, Bay Area this in August. And then in September, I'm going to Toronto Veg Fest. I'll be uh, speaking up there. Cool. And then I'm going on the Vegan Alaskan Cruise, wow. Vegan Vacation at Sea. So that's a week-long cruise there. And then I'll be at um, um, San Francisco Veg Fest. And I can't remember. There's a couple of other events. It's kind of a really busy period right there. Ooh. Me too. I'll be at the San Francisco Veg Fest too. So I'll get oh, good. All right. I'll see you great. there. So do, yeah. last question, do you ever get to see your husband? <laughs> um, well, let's see. I think I might have seen him about three weeks ago. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> he went to Italy with me. We had fun. Good, good, good. That's <laughs> yeah. great. Well, anyway, thank you for what you do because, you know, we know that as far as even for health, if you could only make one change, my my recommendation and all the doctors I work with is to give up dairy now and forever. And so you've made it possible. You've made it easy. You've made it delicious. So thank you for doing that, not just with the book, but now with the cheese line. And I just think you're awesome. And I love you. And all of you guys listening, I love you too. So thank you so much for listening to Healthy Living. I'm Chef AJ, and I make healthy taste delicious. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Miyoko. Thanks, AJ. Thanks, AJ. Okay. All bye. right. Okay, bye-bye.